Hello. <laughs> so yeah, I'm back. Drake Bellick. Uh, ooh, let me just adjust that a little bit. Or adjust myself, I guess. I just want to get myself as centered as possible. Uh, yeah. Drake Bellick. Back talking about Big Brother because, uh, I just want to talk about Big Brother. And I want to talk about it going into the upcoming season. There is only 16 days until it premieres. Is it 16? It's 15. Uh, I probably should have counted better before I... <laughs> Hold on, let me just fix my stream name. There. There, now it says 15 days. As it should, because there's 15 days left. So, uh... Yeah, um, I did a stream on Big Brother the other day when I was down the Cape, the Cape Cod, on vacation. I live in Massachusetts, and Cape Cod is just everyone's vacation spot around here. And I brought my laptop down, and I tried to do a stream there, but uh, first of all, I forgot to plug my headphones in. And my laptop does have a mic, but I don't know what the sound is like. And also, I forgot to put the word out on Twitter that I was live, so I only got one viewer. And they didn't comment anything. So, yeah, it already started off rough. And on top of that, I just, I don't know what it was. I couldn't stop scratching my nose, and it looked like I was picking my nose. And I'm just like, I can't do this. And it was just, it was so bad. It was such a bad stream that I deleted the footage entirely. I'm like, there's only one person who saw this. Like, who cares? So, you know, if that one person is back, I mean, I guess they'd be watching this on YouTube because they're not here right now. But uh, I'm going to talk about some of the same stuff. Not everything that I talked about, because I realized some of it was just not that interesting. But, yeah, a decent number of it. Uh, I have my phone that I have a memo of all my notes on, things I want to talk about. Uh, no one's showing up yet. I'll give it another minute, I guess. The drink of the day is fruit punch. Because you're never too old for fruit punch. And, uh, get rid of that. I'm just trying to, nor trying to normalize adults drinking fruit punch. And, you know, if I ever start making good Twitch money, I might start my own independent Fruit Punch brand. Because, why not? Alright. So, I'll start off talking about... Uh, this is sort of an add-on to something I talked about in my last stream that I did uh, keep, and is now on my YouTube channel. Um... I, I had talked about wanting to see more... I don't like how my hair looks right there. It's a little better. I just didn't like the way it curled. It didn't look right to me. But anyway, um, I talked about how I want to see more diversity. But I only really talked about like racial diversity. But I also want to see it in terms of age. I want to see... Uh, I want to see at least three people over the age of 40 on the show. And... Dare I say, maybe even bring in someone over the age of 60, you know? Like, I know the uh, the oldest contestant who ever played was uh, Jerry in Dan Giesling's season, and he was 75 years old, and he came in third place. So, you know, like, it can be done. It can be done pretty well. So, yeah, I, I would like to see more age representation instead of just one token over 40 person. And uh, I know that on All-Stars there were actually a couple contestants that were over the age of 40. I think it was like five of them. But uh, the oldest, well the two oldest were Enzo and Keisha and they were 42 which is like not old. Really. 
And also, like, BB-22 is just not a good representation of anything Big Brother related, okay? So, you know, it's just, let's just get that out of our heads. And also, I would like to see more uh, sexuality diversity, like more LGBTQ plus people. Because, uh, like, here, here's what I would like to see. I would like there to be two gay men in the house. And to me, this has two ways that it could go really well. The first way it could go well is the obvious way. They get in a showmance, and that's positive representation. Or they could hate each other. And I don't know about you, but I think that anytime I see two gay guys that hate each other, it is the funniest thing in the world. <laughs> so, like, if that is what we get on Big Brother, I think that would be just TV gold. Like, it'd be... It'd be the best, <laughs> you know? So, like, there's the there's the hopeful, the positive one, and then there's the more cynical but still kind of amusing one. You know, that's, that's just how I... That's how I feel about it. Now, um... I just want to make sure that my tweet actually did go out. I mean, I hit post, but, you know, at least I thought I did. Okay, I did. I just don't have anyone interested in watching yet. But, you know, I am still pretty new at this, still trying to get going. Yeah, that, what I just did, I... I I was doing that all of my last stream. I, I couldn't help it. My nose is just so itchy. And I look like I was pecking it. I swear I'm not. I'm not a child. Okay. Now, the other thing that I wanted to talk about in my last stream, and I did talk about, but again, the footage got deleted because the stream was a disaster. Um... I wanted to talk about Big Brother gameplay that I've seen on Unexpected Shows. And it was actually seeing it on an Unexpected Show right around my first Big Brother season that I was like, okay, I think I'm starting to get what this is all about. Uh, my, my first Big Brother season was BB-18, which was in 2016. And, I mean, I had, like, kind of... My brother was obsessed with it. He's been obsessed with it forever. And he was uh, he was watching it. And, like, I kind of knew the gist of what was going on. I knew most of the people. Like, I knew who Paul was, for sure. I knew who Victor was. But uh, I just... I slowly started getting sucked into it. I have one viewer. Hello. I don't know how long you've been here, but I just noticed. So, thank you. Um... But yeah, 2016 was my first Big Brother season, and like I, I was kind of into it in the beginning, but then like by the end of it, I was just like, I gotta watch this every week. And I think part of what made me become a fan was when I was, uh, I was watching MasterChef at the same time. That airs on Fox. Almost every summer. It didn't air last summer because of the pandemic. They they started filming what would have aired last summer, but they had to shut it down because of the pandemic. But this season that's airing now is what was supposed to air last summer. But anyway, um, I was seeing like some kind of strategic gameplay that was like targeting other threats, and like. I was telling that to my brother, and he was kind of watching it, too, for the most part. But, like, I was telling him what was going on, and he's just like, you should just watch Big Brother, because this is what goes on there. And when I really started getting into Big Brother, I realized he was right. So, like, how it started in in that season of MasterChef, it was season... It would have been season seven. Um... Now, 
like I said, this is Big Brother gameplay you see on unexpected shows because on Master Chef, it's not just about being more strategic and more cutthroat than everybody. You still have to make good food. Like that's that's the end all be all of that competition. But there are ways in which you can target your competition. And there was a guy on Master Chef season seven named Sean. And he was a pretty good player. He was a very good chef. And you know, he was a good leader and everything and team challenges. And yeah, like this this guy, he was just he was really smart. And he had reality show instincts. And when it got to the final nine of that season, um, I don't remember exactly what the challenge was, but uh, okay, the way that Master Chef works, or at least that episode worked, was that there was one challenge in the beginning, and the chef who made the best dish would win an advantage. And that advantage usually involves immunity, like they don't have to compete in the next competition. And then they get to decide what the others are going to make, and then they can decide to try and target. They might get an additional advantage that will allow them to target one or two people. And at this point in the competition, there were two other really talented chefs. Their names were Terry and Tenoria. Now, at that point of the show, those three were my top three. <laughs> they were the ones I was rooting for the most. And Sean wins the advantage, and he makes a point of targeting Terry and Tenoria with the challenge. And it worked, because they were the bottom two. Everyone else was safe. And, like, on some level, I was kind of hurt, because it's like, one of my favorites is targeting my other two favorites. And Terry was my number one favorite, and he was the one that was eliminated. And I was pretty upset about that, but... Like, the more I thought about it, the more I realized that is a pretty strategic gameplay. Like, you know, Sean saw a threat, well, he saw two threats, and he targeted those threats, and he got one of them out. So, yeah, I, I was impressed by it, and since I was really starting to get into Big Brother around the same time, I was just like, yeah, I, I think I need to check out Big Brother. I think this... This might just be for me. And since then, I have not seen that level of strategy very often on Big Brother. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that, that's that's what I said. This is Big Brother gameplay I've seen on other shows. And in some cases, done better. And uh, you know, as you know, Master Chef. Features Gordon Ramsay as one of the judges, but of course, Gordon Ramsay has his other show, L's Kitchen. Did I say L? Eh, either way, I, I call it HK. <laughs> I've been watching it so long. And, uh, you know, sometimes there's that level of strategy on that show as well. But again, like, the decision comes down to Ramsay himself. Like, if you don't make good food, then he's going to throw you out. But in like you can try and be manipulative with the nominations, but he can eliminate whoever he wants. He eliminates people who aren't nominated. He eliminates people during service. He eliminates people who are on the winning team. That happens every now and then. But that really started in Season 2. Like the second episode of Season 2. Uh, the person who got the nomination powers, the best of the worst, as he called it. Uh, he nominated two people, but then Ramsey was like, nope, I am I want to hear from this other guy. And he brought this other guy up, and that guy got eliminated. So yeah, that was when it became apparent to everybody that you don't have to be nominated. If you screw up bad enough, you're gone. But in season one, Ramsey seemed to be bound by the nominees. And a contestant by the name of Michael used this to his advantage quite well. 
Um, so it got down to seven. It was two teams, three people versus four people. Michael was on the four-person team, and they lost. I believe they were the red team. It's the red team versus blue team until it gets down to the end when they're all the black team, the black jackets. But, uh, yeah, Michael becomes best of the worst. And the other three chefs on his team are Jimmy, who had not done very well, like, throughout, and uh, was definitely the weakest on the team that night. Chris, who was an executive chef. Him, Michael, and a guy on the other team were, like, the only professional chefs that season, because back then it was mostly amateurs. Nowadays, amateurs can't get on HK. Now they got to go to MasterChef. Um, so, yeah, Michael, Jimmy, Chris, and then Elsie. And she was uh, a mother of six. Like, that was her listed occupation, I think. Mother of six. Or mother of... Mother of however many children she has. Like, that was listed as her occupation. Whereas Michael was professional chef. Chris was executive chef. I, Jimmy, I don't remember what his job was. But, uh, anyway. Michael gets named best of the worst. He gets to nominate two people. He and Chris are talking, and Chris thinks he has a good rapport with Michael because, you know, they're the professional chefs. But Chris, he was not great that night. But, uh, you know, him and Michael are like, okay, we're going to do Jimmy and Elsie. We're going to nominate them. And, you know, Elsie obviously did not win best of the worst, but she was definitely second. Like, I would say the two weakest were Jimmy and Chris during that service. Jimmy was the weakest, and Chris was second weakest. But um, I think that Michael knew this. He knew that Elsie did a little bit better of a job than Chris, and that Jimmy would go if he was nominated. So he puts up Elsie and Chris, and Ramsey eliminates Chris. Michael's biggest competition on that team. It was very cutthroat, and Chris was quite blindsided by it. But, you know, sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do. And Michael went on to win Season 1 of HK. And, by the way, that guy Sean on MasterChef, he went on to win Season 7. So, yeah. It works. It does work. And, uh, I'll do another, uh, HK example. Um, this is actually from the season before the one that's currently airing. Like, season 20 is the season of HK that's on now. Season 19 just ended literally, like, two months ago. And, like, they aired the seasons almost back-to-back. -back. But they filmed them back-to-back, -back and they had them waiting for, like, two years and like, why didn't they just put them on during the pandemic? They had them ready to go. Fox would have gotten the best ratings that they've ever gotten for HK. Because, you know, nobody else was making shows. Or very few people were making shows at that point. Like, it was something for people to watch. You know? Like, people who never watched the show before were like, eh, screw it. I was going to say Gordon Ramsay yell at some people. But anyway... That's beside the point. That's that's just a little business decision at Fox that I don't agree with. But back to the season itself, season 19. Um, now, it starts off with even teams for blue and red, but if one team starts losing too many people and it becomes too lopsided, then Ramsey will send someone from the other team over to even it out. And when I say that, I mean that nowadays... It's typically someone from the red team, the women's team, that has to go over to the blue team, which is the men's team. And it's like, it's all the time, because they just keep casting dumb guys. Like, they cast maybe two halfway decent male chefs for the season, and then just so many idiots that they just start running through them. 
and the the blue team, they lost two chefs right away. They were the first two to go. Then the red team lost one. And then this one actually was not this chef's fault, but someone from the blue team got um, sick and had to leave for medical reasons. So at that point, that was 14 people that were left. So it was eight on the red team and six on the blue team. So someone from the red team had to go over, and he picked this lady named Amber. And she was not happy about it. And she made that clear every single episode. She did not want to be on the blue team. And the more she didn't want to be there, the more the rest of the blue team didn't want her there. And, like, her heart wasn't in it working on the blue team. So, you know, she'd mess up in service, and the blue team would be like, all right, well, Amber, we're going to put you up because you didn't do too well tonight. And she was just like, oh, my God, they hate me. They're just out to get me. Which, no, it wasn't that. You just weren't helping the team. You weren't much of a team player, like, ever. But after every service where she was nominated, and even some where she wasn't, a chef on the red team named Corey, she would talk to Amber. Yeah, it was a woman named Corey, just so that's clear. I know that's a name that goes both ways. And Corey would feed into it. She'd just be like, yeah, you gotta just be looking out for yourself. They're not gonna look out for you. And it just made Amber more paranoid. And I just spit right on my laptop. Oh, boy. <sighs> Sorry about that. <sighs> I did that a lot in the, the failed stream, too. Where was I? Right. Corey would feed into Amber's paranoia and make her more paranoid. And then the red team would just keep winning. The red team won so many services and a lot of the challenges, too. And, like, it was just, like, Amber was one of the main struggles on the blue team. There was one person on the blue team who was way worse. He just had the, a very obnoxious, aggressive attitude like, he tried to be a hype man, but he was just so aggressive with it, and no one liked him. His name was Mark. And when he finally went, I was just thinking, okay, the blue team now has three people. It's Amber, who, you know, she would have made it to the final seven of the competition if she couldn't cook. She could. She cooked very well at times. And then the other two guys were, by far, the two best male chefs of the season, their names were Declan, who was my favorite from minute one. Just random shout out to Declan. And Cody. And I'm like, okay, this is a good team right here. I think they have what it takes to actually win the next service. But Amber was just like, no, I still don't trust you guys. And so it was like, she didn't really help them in the next service. And it ended up being a joint loss. And guess what? Amber got nominated again. Because she made the most mistakes. Because her attitude wasn't great. Do I have a... Is that a stain? I, I cannot see that stain in real life. But the camera is showing it off for me. That's nice. I guess I'll just duck down a little or pull it down more. I don't know. So yeah, that was uh, just a few examples of Big Brother gameplay that I've seen on other shows. Okay, there is one other thing I want to talk about. This is actually a moment that was a missed opportunity for some amazing Big Brother gameplay on MasterChef that a contestant did not take. So we're going to Season 8 of MasterChef now. And it's the final six. Well, it's the second time it's the final six, because the first time, no one was eliminated. So, the challenge for the final six... Uh, well, yeah, the, the challenge, this lady named Kate wins. And she gets the advantage. Now, the other contestants included Jason, who always made extremely elaborate dishes... 
And then there were Ebony and Dino, who were very strong and consistent all the way through. And there was Yashika, who started strong, but was long overdue for an elimination. And then there was Jeff, who was even longer overdue for an elimination. Because he he was not on a winning team in any of the team challenges through the entire season. Not one. Not a single one. Because he was not a good team player. And he had decent moments when he was uh, on the show. But he never actually won any challenges either. He made it to the final six without winning a challenge or a like an individual challenge or a team challenge. So, yeah, he was definitely long overdue for an elimination. Even longer than Yashika. But here is the advantage that Kate received. The other five chefs would have to shop and cook their dish in a different amount of time. One chef would get 60 minutes to cook. One chef would get 50. One would get 40. One would get 30. One would get 20. Now, my gut reaction was make it so that Jason only has 20 minutes so that he can't do anything complicated like he likes to do. And that might hurt him, and he is a very big threat because he had won a lot of challenges individual and team and like this this is like one of the front runners here and this is a golden opportunity to get him out and then i would have given jeff the full 60 minutes because he's not a threat let him take his time let him make whatever dish he wants and then yashika give her 50 minutes because again that's plenty of time for her to make something and it would trip the others up the better ones uh kate did not see it that way she gave Jason the full 60 minutes, and he made another very complex dish that the judges loved. And she gave Jeff 20 minutes. And he was eliminated, but Yashika was also eliminated. She had the 40 minutes to cook. And Yashika's may have actually been worse than Jeff's, because when Yashika presented her dish... One of the judges, I'm pretty sure it was Ramsey, said that it was the worst dish he had seen at this late stage of the competition. And then Jeff presented his, and it was not much better. It was like, I believe it was raw salmon, raw fish of some kind, or severely undercooked. It was just but raw, basically. Yeah, yeah, it was raw, for sure. And Yashika was eliminated. Like, Ramsey said... The person leaving is Yashika and Jeff. So yeah, technically, Yashika was eliminated first. But still, like, I just feel that was such a missed opportunity for Kate. Give Jeff his full 60 minutes. And if he still screws it up and gets eliminated for it, then that's just hilarious. <laughs> but that's just me. And, uh, you want to hear another way that this plan failed on Kate? She went into the final four against three very good chefs. Chefs who had cooked in more challenges because Kate was not on a single losing team in any of the team challenges until the very last team challenge, which was the first time she was with Jeff. There I go, spitting again and again. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. I have a problem. <laughs> so yeah. Um, final four is Kate, Jason, Ebony, and Dino. And the others have been in plenty of precarious situations. Like they had low scoring dishes or they were on losing teams. Kate never had those. Except for one time she was on the losing team. And... Kate was eliminated next. So yeah. She really, really missed her opportunity there. If she had just tried to make it so Jeffrey Yashika would make it to the next round with her, she could have uh she could have made a difference and she could have made it to the end. 
But, you know, Dino ended up winning, and he was my favorite from the moment I saw him, so I wasn't too upset about it. And also, Jason was from around here, so I was rooting for him, too. And I also really liked Ebony. So, yeah. I didn't dislike Kate, but I just liked the other ones more. I thought they were more interesting. And, yeah. Kate, I'd like to say she wouldn't do well on Big Brother, but I feel like she wouldn't be a strategic player on Big Brother. I still think she would go far because she was pretty. <laughs> and sometimes on Big Brother, that's all you need. I mean, didn't pan out too well for Janelle last season. She was gorgeous and was the third one out. But, you know, them's the breaks sometimes. Hey, uh, you know, the person, the one viewer I have... If you have any Big Brother-related stuff you want to talk about, you know, feel free to respond. I want to talk to someone. I've just been talking to myself this whole time. <laughs> Alright, so, uh... You know, since I failed at the last stream, like, since that time... There have been some um, Big Brother updates for the new season. Like, we have seen, um, like, the logo. Actually, the logo may have been revealed before my last stream. I'm not 100% sure on that. But uh, it's just Julie holding a key, standing on top of the Big Brother logo on a grassy field with the, the Hollywood Hills in the background. And, you know, it was all well and good. But then it it came out that it's a, a beach theme, and there is no beach anywhere in sight in the picture. Like, there's a palm tree. That's about it. But, like, like you see palm trees at the beach, but you also see them not at the beach. So, it was almost like you were standing on the beach but looking at the land, you know? <laughs> it, uh, it was weird. But, you know, maybe they were just like, okay, we have this logo, and let's just, oh, here's, here's a really good picture that someone on the Big Brother crew took of the Hollywood Hills, so let's just use it and put the new logo in it and Photoshop Julie onto it holding a key. And it's like, sure, why not? Let's just go with it. Although I will say the Big Brother logo itself does look a little, like, brownish, like, you know, it looks almost like it was, like, it's a sand sculpture. So maybe that is the, the beach element of it, maybe, perhaps, I don't know. Um, I really just thought of that right now, and I'm like, eh, let's just throw it out there and, and see if, uh, if that's a thing. And uh, another theme of the season that we've been hearing is Rebirth. And some have been speculating, like, is it a new house? But I don't think it is. They've been at the same one for so long. And, like, uh, a Big Brother um, streamer and YouTuber about it, um, someone that I really enjoy, uh, Nerdtainment, um, they pointed out that there is something going on at the Big Brother house. The the lady from that, her name is Sarah. Hi, Sarah. I don't know if you're watching, but if you are, then hi. <laughs> um, yeah, she went by where the Big Brother house is and took a picture. And there's there's stuff going on. Don't know exactly what, but something's going on there. So... I don't think it'll be a new house, but I think it could be a rebirth in the sense of, like, the the Derek way of playing Big Brother has been the preeminent thing for a while now. You know, it was Derek, and then it was Paul, and then it was Tyler, and then, then it was Mickey, I guess, kinda. 
Although it didn't work out for him too much of the time because he at least sat on the block on eviction night once. Which is more than the others for the most part. Actually, no, I guess Tyler did too. You know, I... You know, maybe the whole sitting on the block thing isn't a factor. You know, now that I think about it, Mickey actually did it less than some of the people that I mentioned, except Derek. Paul, in their first season, they were nominated several times. But in BB-19, the only time they faced eviction was on finale night. And, and Josh was like, no, nah, I have a better chance of beating Paul. But like that, my point is, that kind of gameplay has been done by those guys. Like Derek, and then Paul, and then Tyler, and then Mickey, and then Cody. And Cody, he, he, he never knew struggle in the Big Brother game. Like, he would know inconvenience for, like, a couple days, and then everything would go his way again. And he would just get what he wanted. And I'm like, this is not even the slightest bit entertaining, and I hate you. <laughs> hey, Cody, if you're watching. <laughs> I... I mentioned there was a, a Cody on the last season of HK, and I was still so gun-shy from Cody from Big Brother and Cody from BB-19 also. I hated him even more. And I was still just so gun-shy about the name Cody that I saw a Cody on HK, and I'm like, oh my god, I'm gonna hate this guy too. I'm just... Ugh. But that Cody actually impressed me. I, I liked him. So I think uh, for the Rebirth theme, it might be just trying to get people that aren't going to play that way, or at least won't just make it the whole thing. Like, just try and do away with one alliance of obvious Big Brother stereotypes or archetypes just not, don't have those kinds of people in the house to just get together and gang up and demolish everybody. Like, find people that look like that that are willing to target the people who look like them. The typical Big Brother archetypes. Is it archetype or archetype? I feel like I've heard both. Anyway, uh, yeah, I would love it if there's just one big, muscle-bound, good-looking dude who, like, looks like the kind of Big Brother player that would play that kind of game of just getting with all the the strong, good-looking people and just ganging up on the, the weaker ones, for lack of a better word. But then, secretly, he's working with the, the underdogs and getting them to turn against his alliance. Like, that's what I would like to see, you know? Someone who's like a mole. I think that'd be pretty cool. And, uh... And yeah, just rebirth. It's just... Let's just hope it's a new thing. Let's hope this is the ushering in of a new era of Big Brother. Like, the last new era that was ushered in was BB-16. Which I didn't watch, but at this point I know basically everything about it. I know who won. I, I know who came in second. I know the kind of gameplay that was prevailing in that season. And yeah, I just, I know everything about it and I'm just like, I don't need to watch it now. And that was like the last new era of the show. And it's time for a new one because this era has more than run its course. And I'm pretty sure there were people that didn't even like it then. But, like, now it really has to... It's time for something new. Otherwise, people are going to lose interest in the show. They just are. Sorry. You listening to me, Big Brother? I know you're watching. <laughs> no, you're not. But, yeah. It's, it's time. It's time for a, a new level of gameplay. It's time for a new level of gunning for each other. Or Big Brother isn't going to survive. And, you know, this summer, it's going up against the Olympics. 
So, yeah. The ratings already may not be good. Like, the Olympics combined with the, how not good the last two seasons were. BB-21 was not great by any stretch of the imagination, but I still see people say it was the worst season ever, and I'm like, no, it was not. It was better than BB-19. It was way better than BB-22. Like, BB-21 was a bad season with good moments. BB-22 was a bad season with worse moments. Moments that were worse than bad. Like, every week of BB-22 was just the worst case scenario. Like, the worst way it could have gone, the most taunting and painful way it could have gone, that's the way it went. Every week. Like, every week, someone who would have made a difference was this close to winning HOH. Like, from the, the second HOH to, like, the, the last pre-Jerry HOH. Like, any one of those could have been won by someone that would have really made a difference. And, uh, I guess, uh, The last thing I'll talk about is that they've confirmed that there will be no audience this year. Which I get because, like, the pandemic is... My God, stop spitting. <sighs> Sorry. The pandemic is on its way out, but it's, it's still... It's still a thing. Like, we can't just pretend it's completely gone. But I feel like if Big Brother wants to do its part to promote vaccination, then maybe make it a, a live audience, but only give tickets to people who can confirm they've been vaccinated. You know? That'll get people vaccinated quick. Because I know that there is a, a demographic of the Big Brother fandom that wouldn't be into getting vaccinated because of, uh, well, it just sort of lines up with the way that they've seen how the show has gone. Like, the kind of people that get annoyed when people try to talk about social justice issues in the real world. There, there are people who get angry when that kind of thing happens, and, uh, you know, that's the, the correlation, or I guess not a correlation, it's like a, the, okay, like a, if there's a Venn diagram of people who watch Big Brother and hate the social justice talks, and people who watch Big Brother who don't want to get vaccinated, like, if that were a Venn diagram, it would be this. Now, as you can see, I have made a circle. <laughs> yeah. I, uh... I mean, you know... I'm just calling it like I see it. And you, you know, I'm just... I'm just pointing out things that these people have said. And you know, sometimes you click on their profile... And just in their bio, you get more of a description of what they're like, and it's just like, oh, yeah, okay, you're you're going to be very tedious to deal with as a fan. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, I've talked for about 45 minutes now and spit a few times. <laughs> Again, sorry. And I did it all with no comments. So I talked to myself for 45 minutes. I like to say that's pretty good for me, but, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time by myself. I did even before the pandemic, so, you know, I'm kind of used to it by now. <laughs> but yes, that will do it for this stream. If you're watching on YouTube, thank you. Feel free to, to comment there. I will respond to comments there. 
I should probably stop now because I now have the hiccups. <laughs> okay. That'll do it for this stream. I'll be back probably when we start getting updates on the house and when we start seeing the contestants, which, based on the past, excluding last season, obviously, because it was All-Stars, but in the past, like a week before the premiere, that's when we get to see the, uh, the house guests for the first time and the house for the first time. So I might be back next week with another one of these talking about, you know, whatever updates they decide to give us. But that'll do it for now, and I will see you next time.